Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming to SaltConf. I thoroughly enjoy SaltConf, especially when they're over. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Thomas Hatch. Um, I am terribly, uh, terribly underqualified to teach you anything about salt because I wrote it. So I'm, I'm the original author of Salt. Um, uh, let's see, we've got a couple of guys from Sousa here. So to just back you guys up, I've got Arch Linux on my laptop. That was not Sousa. Okay. <laughs> so we're all good. <laughs> okay, this talk is about grokking salt architecture and design paradigms. Now, what I'm going to be talking about is a lot to do with the salt master and how the internal workings of the salt master function. Okay? This is a somewhat advanced talk. The salt system's design is fundamentally revolves around a few concepts. Now these concepts are first and foremost plugins. I am more obsessed with plugins than, than what should be considered healthy. Salt's design uh, has a lot of plugins and a lot of plugin systems, which again is a huge benefit uh, to the system overall. And it's one of the things that allows us to have the ridiculous level of flexibility that we enjoy inside of SALT. Now, I'm going to be talking about a few of these plug-in systems today and talking about how they work, where they plug in, and, uh, and how you can extend them. And especially since I have Mike Place here who's going to be able to navigate code on the screen for you when that happens. It'll happen. It's going to be great. Okay, did, did I just get a heckle? Okay, now, oh no, don't bother. <laughs> no, Mike's got it, right, you got this? Yeah, I can find my other adapter. Does anybody have a Mac adapter to HDMI? USB-C. USB-C? USB -C? <laughs> okay. I'll go look for one. One of the other, one of the other core design principles here, thank you. One of the other core design principles of SALT is asynchronicity. Sorry, that was a little low. I was not going for your head there. Okay. But the first thing that I want to talk about, I'm on the third slide now, thanks. Throw up the second one for us for a second there. Second? Yeah. Slide. <laughs> Hooray. Um, oh, I know I forgot something. How we, could, how we connect the three models of salt together. One of the things that's challenging when you explain salt to somebody is telling them quite what it is. Most people look at it and they say, oh, it's another config system. And then you say, but it's more than that. And they say, what does that mean? And you say, I don't know <laughs> how to explain that. And then I have to share that sentiment with you. It took me a while to figure out how to explain that, to be perfectly frank. SALT itself operates across three fundamental paradigms. The idea is that configuration management is insufficient to abstract the management of a system, whether an individual system or especially a distributed set of systems. And that we've got three main premises inside of SALT, and that is, and configuration management is definitely one of these, but also the remote execution and event-driven automation. And that what SALT is, is the expression of configuration management remote execution and event-driven automation to facilitate a full automation system to manage whatever the devil you want to manage. Okay? All right. Thank you, sir. So the first thing that I want to talk about here is 
a concept that I call plug-in oriented programming. So when I started working on SALT, I build out the remote execution system, and I say, well, I want to make sure that uh, the functions that I can call are pluggable, right? Because that makes sense. And so I built the SALT loader system, and I didn't really understand what I had at the moment. But as SALT continued to grow, I made more things pluggable. And so the end result is what, you're, what you know of today, if, if any of you have looked inside of the code of SALT, that there are, uh, there's an invertible bonanza of plug-in systems inside of SALT. And over time, what happened is that the plugins dramatically overweighed or overcame, as far as the sheer volume of code, the rest of the application and the rest of SALT. So that the vast majority of the code turned into plugins. And so a, few, uh, a year or so ago, I needed to, I kind of stepped back and I said, okay, what's actually going on here from a software development perspective? Because we've got this problem of, or I should say we've got this benefit of, <laughs> of having all of these plugin systems. And these plugin systems are intercommunicating with each other. And so I started to try and draw up what this would look like from a pure programming perspective and came up with uh, this concept of plugin-oriented programming, or POP. So in SALT, what we end up doing is that we've got a spine for the application. This is the area where the system starts up in the code. This is the area where the plugin software exists. And then this is the area where um, some of the really central aspects of SALT that aren't quite pluggable exist. And then we have a plugin layer and then there's everything else, just a collection of plugins on top. And then the plugin layer in SALT allows these plugin systems to talk to each other. And then if any of you have written modules for SALT, you're well aware of the fact that these modules are able to automatically detect and change themselves based on the environment in which they run. Which is why we're able to have plugins that automatically activate on different Linux operating systems to expose the package manager of those systems, okay? Inside of these modules, it's just the virtual function, but the benefit here is that we are able to create plugin subsystems which dynamically modify themselves relative to their surroundings. Okay? And so as we continue to build salt out more and more, significantly larger amounts of the code continue to be inside of the plugin layers. And so a lot of what I want to talk to you about today are some of those plugin layers, particularly around the salt master what they do and what some of that code looks like. And I'm gonna have my esteemed colleague here running around and opening up code examples. He's gonna try and surprise me and throw me curveballs, I'm sure. All right, now I've got a little graphic down there, be down there below that says what I would like pop programming to be. This is like my little dream of creating a, pro a programming system that would be 100% pluggable. Fun times, that would be slick. But anyway. Uh, let's keep going. So let's start by talking about the salt master and what the salt master actually is. The salt master itself is a highly pluggable system, but more importantly, uh, the salt master has quite a lot going on inside of it. A lot of processes that are intercommunicating in numerous different ways, um, a lot of systems that uh, facilitate it to reach the scale that it does, as well as exposing quite a few services back down to uh, the minions that are connected to it and exposing services back out to the users that are interacting with it. Um, so if we move ahead one more slide here. Thank you. Um, I've got the beginning of an architecture slide of the master. Now, we've, we've got a number of these uh, architecture images floating around. 
and this is the master and the minion, but I want to take you really quickly through what happens on a few basic operations on a salt master. So on a salt master up here, uh, let's say that you are just running a salt command, right? Salt star test dot fib or ping. Test.fib is the Fibonacci sequence. It's, sorry, whatever. Okay. <laughs> so what this does is that the CLI client initializes and then it sends a request, okay, into the salt master's request server. The salt master request server forwards all of its requests back to the workers. So as many of you have probably done in your salt master configurations, you've edited the uh, worker threads. They're really processes. Um, that got changed a long time ago. <laughs> but you've edited the worker threads to have more worker processes available to you. So the request goes back into the worker, into one of the workers, okay? When the request goes into the worker, the worker says, is this person authorized to run this command? And then it says, yes, it is. And then it computes what we call the pub payload. The pub payload is a very small um, piece of information which is sent down to all of the minions so that they know what work is going to be done. But before we actually send that out, actually we kind of fork off at this point, the worker sends an event to the event bus. All right, so at this point, we've got the request server interface. And then worker processes behind it. And then we have the event bus process. The event bus itself, again, is just a process. That process is listening on two local sockets. One of those local sockets is a poll interface where we're able to say, Hey, event bus, can you please fire this event for me? And the other is where subscribers attach to the event bus and wait for the events to come through. It's not too terribly complicated. All right. So that local client subscribed to the event bus before it sent anything down. Now, we've got to subscribe to the event bus before we send a request down because we found out that salt was too fast for salt. Uh, we would send a request to the request server, the worker would validate it, and then the worker would, in parallel, send the uh, command to the publisher to run on the minion at the same time that it would send a command to the request server to tell the local client, this is what you're watching for. And by the time the local client got that request back and attached to the event bus to listen to it, the minion had already responded, and it was done. So, salt was too, too fast for itself. All right, so the client connects to the event bus initially, gets the return from the worker that says, this is the job you're looking for, the job ID, and then sends that pub payload to the publisher. Everything that we send over the wire in SALT is serialized using something called message pack. Who here is familiar with message pack? All right, I just learned how to fill the next 30 seconds. <laughs> data serialization simply means, right, that we take some complex data set and turn it into a string, which can be reconstituted someplace else. The most commonly used example of this, of course, being JSON. So, Early in the days of SALT, I, I will admit, on the original versions of SALT, I was using Python pickles for this uh, because I was being very lazy. Uh, but I was just in my basement. It was OK. Only LinkedIn was using SALT at this point. Now, <laughs> what happens in that serialization is a question as to how large that serialization is going to be, as well as how quickly we can serialize that data set. Message pack is a binary form, is effectively a binary form of JSON. So I ran a quick test against a number of different data sets to determine which serialization medium would be the fastest. 
Um, on uh, my most pronounced test, it took JSON about five seconds to serialize. It took a Python pickle about six seconds to serialize. It took YAML about a minute to serialize. And it took message pack 0 0.0008 seconds to serialize. Uh, so that, that uh, became a rather clear choice. All right. So the publisher message comes down to the salt minion. And then the minion says, am I going to execute this? So this is one of the gateways in the system to determine whether or not this job was intended for this minion. Now, thanks to actually someone in this room, there he is, Thomas Jackson. Uh, we also have gateways on the master so that we are not publishing out blanketly and always to everybody. Now, the minion says, am I going to execute this? And then if it decides that it is going to execute that job, it starts a new process. Um, this is probably part of the process that you're more familiar with. Uh, we internally call this a jobber process. And then when the jobber is done, it returns the information back up to the request server. Now, then the request server goes back into a worker and sends this information off to a returner as well as the event bus. So that's a really quick overview of the master's architecture. But more importantly, I now want to point out a number of different plugin systems that exist along that path. So when the salt minion started up, it generated its grains. That's a plugin system. When the salt minion started up, it loaded up all of the execution modules. That's a plugin system. Um, it loaded up all of the state modules so that it could do remote execution, or sorry, so that it could do configuration management. That's another plugin system. When the master started up, it started quite a few other plugin systems. So if you're, not, if you're not bored of that last slide by now, I'm terribly sorry. So I needed a graphic for someone running, and who runs the most? So that is a GIF of Tom Cruise running. It's, it's a cliche. It's kind of like uh, a Chris Evans on a motorcycle is a cliche. Actually, I should have gotten a GIF of Mike Place running. For those of you who don't know, Mike Place does do those like super marathon things where people die. He's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Mike, can you advance the slide, please? Of course. Every time I put a GIF on there, uh, people complain that their ADD breaks them down. So I, I made a convenient GIF-less slide to be up while talking. Okay, runners are probably one of, the, one of the plugin systems that you're more familiar with. To oversimplify what a runner is, is it's just, it's just a process that we execute on the master. Now, one of the major benefits, or the, the original reason why I wrote runners, to be honest, was that I wrote a script on the master to do like a peripheral job. And I thought to myself, oh, I'm going to have to write like 20 of these. I just make a plugin system so I don't have to make a like, sh script for these every time. Runners. The reality now is that runners are extremely useful for doing things particularly like state.orchestrate. Um, but more importantly, the runner system allows you to create a plugin which you have active access and control into regardless of how you're interfacing with the master. Because all of the runners are accessible via all of the APIs which we expose. Whether you're communicating with the SALT API uh, with SALT via the command line or via the open API or via the enterprise API, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Runners are all available. All right. Runners aren't the most intriguing thing on the list. Uh, so I'm actually going to just move forward. If we have more time at the end, then I'll come back and we'll, 
we'll open up and actually look at how to write a runner. Okay, so what's next? <laughs> well, what is next? Oh, master file server. <laughs> okay, if we look back at that diagram, or if, if we think back to the diagram, I won't make Mike go back to it. He could if he wants to troll me. When the minion gets that job, it has to have ongoing communication back up to the salt master, right? This is still going through the request server. The request server also has a built-in file system, or a built-in file server. Now, the master file server was originally made pluggable when we introduced GitFS. Uh, who here used GitFS right when it came out in like 2014? I'm really sorry about that. Like it works a lot better now. <laughs> All right, since these systems are pluggable, we are able to take internal components of a salt master and modify them via these plugin interfaces. So that means that the default master file system is just pulling those files off of serve salt, right? But the benefit that we have is that we don't really care where these files come from or how they get to you, which is why we are able to create something like the GitFS file server backend or the S3 file server backend so that your master can be continuously connected to any remote file source. One of my goals in creating Salt and I don't think that it's by any means been completely fulfilled, but in many respects, I think we've done an okay job. But one of my goals is that if you've got a system which is made to configure and manage your infrastructure, I wanted to minimize how often you would need to manage that system itself, which yes, is a daunting task. But the ability to have something like a master file server interact directly with an external system makes that very easy. One of the other reasons why Salt has a file server built into it like this is because Salt's file server is based on asynchronous parallel communication. It's built so with the idea and concept of having large numbers of systems gather lots of small files in parallel. This is why it performs quite well when you're doing configuration management tasks and it's not the best way to download a DVD ISO. It can do it, but it takes a little while. Okay. Now, actually, can, can anyone identify where that last picture came from? Who said that? Uh, thank you, Way. It's a great movie. Can anyone identify where this picture came from? Buster Keaton. Huh? It's Buster Keaton. Buster Keaton. I'm just trying to remember train. Okay, yeah, it's Buster Keaton. <laughs> the general. Okay. All right. Now, engines are a really special component of the SALT architecture, um, but they're also extremely simple. So I'm actually gonna ask Mike to pull up, pull up an arbitrary engine for us. All right, arbitrary, let's see what he gives me. Oh my gosh, he gave me hip chat. <laughs> All right. An engine allows you to create a plugin which upon starting the salt master, if configured to do so, starts up this, this plugin interface that has access to all of salt's internals um, and then gets to work in its own process. Now the HipChat engine looks like it can connect to uh, and I say it looks like because I shouldn't have asked him to. Yeah, there we go. It listens to HipChat messages and forwards them to Salt. That's right. 
This engine connects to HipChat and then allows you to type commands into HipChat that are run inside of Salt. Which apparently is okay in HipChat. We don't have, do we have a Slack engine? Yes. <laughs> okay. And is okay in Slack. Unless they're being DDoSed. Now, uh, Mike, can you go down to the, uh, to the start function? All right. So all you need to do to create an engine is define a start function. And so the start function is going to be executed and all of the arguments in the start function become arguments that you can pass inside of the configuration. And so, again, one thing that's really, really slick about the Slack and HipChat engines is that as we look at this, can you scroll down a little bit, please, Mike? That'll do. <laughs> as we look at this, we're creating a client connection up to Slack, okay? We're grabbing, the, uh, we're grabbing messages from Slack and then if they're properly formatted, then we're forwarding those back uh, to uh, back to the master. And similarly, and I'm, I'm assuming at this point, we're probably connecting to the event bus somewhere up above so that return information would be able to get forwarded back and posted to Slack so that you would be able to do all your operations in Slack. Similarly, uh, one could create an engine that would be actively connecting to, say, ServiceNow or BMC Remedy, since I mentioned ServiceNow. <laughs> um, or an IRC chat room, or really whatever you'd like. Yes, Gareth. Of course there's one for IRC. We're nerds, aren't we? <laughs> what self-respecting nerd wouldn't include IRC? <laughs> all right, yeah, yeah. So you could all log into Pound, you could attach your master to Pound Salt on IRC and watch the fun begin. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I'm gonna pause here briefly what do I have? Oh my goodness, I've only got till 3.30, right? I'm just too obnoxious. And I really want to get to the last slide, which is thorium. Mostly because I don't think my VP of product is in here. He doesn't like me talking about thorium. Anyway, now, <laughs> oh, they're going to publish this video. Yeah, whatever. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's go down to the next one. Let's see if we can get through all these. Okay, returners. I had a hard time finding a picture to represent returners. Has anyone in here ever returned a watermelon to Costco? <laughs> Those guys will take anything. <laughs> Actually, they stopped taking food a couple years ago. Um, <laughs> if it had been opened. <laughs> All right. One of the things that's really nice about returners, of course, is that we can be forwarding this data to any remote source, right? I think returners is something that people are probably more familiar with. Who in here is familiar with returners in Salt? Man, am I just doing a bad job of engaging people? <laughs> Every time you execute a job in Salt, the job creates a job return. And that return inf um, information by default goes to Salt's default returner, which is just a bunch of files on the, master's, uh, on the master's drive. But uh, the returner interface allows us to forward all those jobs to any arbitrary database. Similarly, it can take the event stream off of the event bus and also forward it. Um, you can create multiple classes of returners. And these are returners which are either just acting as a pipeline to dump job information somewhere, or they're acting as a full external job cache. 
So if you want a full external job cache, there's just more functions that need to be implemented. Okay, Mike, can you give me the next one? Oh, good. All right. Who in here has used uh, the salt reactor? Okay, more people are familiar with the reactor than are with returners. Good. Okay. Who in here has used thorium in salt? Two? All right. So the problem, I shouldn't say problem, the limitation of the salt reactor is, as you've probably noticed, that it's pretty much there to listen to a single event and then react to it. This is a fairly simple interface, right? Well, this bothered me a lot because I wanted to be able to take information from aggregate events and measure things like thresholds or measure things like the absence of something for a long period of time and then react to that. So that we could say something like when, you know, as an incredibly simple example, when load gets to a certain point, do something. Or another incredibly simple example would be um, if this minion hasn't fired an event back to me for the last five minutes, delete its keys we're going to assume it's gone, okay? So, Mike, can you open up a thorium module for me? A thorium does something called flow-based programming. Flow-based programming, for those of you who are not, aware, not familiar with, takes a, a data set and then that data set manipulates the behavior of the program. So the program iterates continually over a potentially changing data set and then as that data set changes, the nature of the program subsequently changes, okay? This model is used in a significant amount of uh, autonomous and robotics programming. Needless to say, despite the fact that thorium is quite powerful, it can be a little tricky to pick up. Now, inside of thorium, thorium continually iterates. And it iterates over a set of compiled salt states but these are thorium salt states, okay? So that the reactor is defined a little differently than it is inside of uh, a standard reactor in salt. And so these thorium salt states need their own modules just like normal salt states, okay? And since we're not just waiting for a single event and then reacting to it, we have to follow a bit of a paradigm. And so Mike is psychic, and he's pulled up status.py. Salt's got beacons, right? On the minion, we can turn on beacons, which are firing events based on stuff that's happening. So one of the beacons is called the status beacon. Now, when the status, if you turn on the status beacon, then you can have it firing on a regular interval, you know, maybe five seconds, maybe a minute, et cetera. Well, if you've turned on the status beacon, it's gonna be sending up some basic load information up to the master in these events. It is also going to be informing the master as to its presence, right? Just because we have a reliable ongoing beacon. Now, if we turn on the status register, in thorium, then that status register is going to keep track of the beacons as they fire so that we have an ongoing in thorium, an ongoing in memory cache of all of the system's current present state. 
So that means that if we make another um, module in Thorium that says something like, if I haven't heard anything, can you open up the key one? If I haven't heard anything, thank you. Yeah, right here. From a minion for a certain period of time, we can turn on the key system in Thorium to automatically clean those keys up. Just as an example. Okay, but so if we take a look at this, for instance, we're able to see, right, we've got, we figure out what time it is now. We're able to, can you scroll down a bit more, please, Mike? Oh my goodness, that's larger than I thought it was. I don't have that kind of time. <laughs> okay, but yeah, we start out by seeing what time it is now. Um, and then we iterate through the minions that are coming in via the status beacon. And then we determine uh, which minions uh, haven't checked in for a long time. We put those minions inside of a remove or reject set. We iterate over those sets. Um, and then we call the salt key API to delete the keys from the system. So we're able to create a register and then we're able to react to things that happen in that register. So in this case, we have a reactor which is reacting to the absence of an event. Okay? All right. Um, I am just about out of time, unfortunately. I've, I've tried to be as engaging as possible with this extremely wide room. Uh, but so I'll ask what I like to ask. Does anybody have any questions, comments, arguments, or rebuttals? Can you talk a little bit about <clears throat> SVB modules and how they fit in when it's salt? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so the question is, can I talk a little bit about SDB modules and how they fit into salt? One of the, one of the problems is that we got a lot of plugin systems. I covered like five. <laughs> uh, what, what are we at now, like, like 47? I mean, like 26? 34. 34? I haven't counted for a while. Last I counted, it was like 26. Actually, we had some contributors who learned how to add plug-in layer uh, systems. I just taught an entire room how. <laughs> <laughs> you, you remember that patch I logged to you that made the loader pluggable? <laughs> All right, anyway. I'm not going to honor Thane's comment with a, with a reverb into the mic. No. <laughs> uh, until we got up to about uh, 23 or 24, I was the only one who had ever written a plug-in system in Salt. So the SDB system, sorry to get back to your question. Occasionally you have a configuration file that you want to grab information from a remote or otherwise secured source. So say you would want to put a, put a password inside of a salt configuration file, but you would really want to store that password in a secure remote source. That's what SDB is for. Um, it stands for salt database. Um, so SDB allows you to create a plugin which can grab, things, grab these configuration uh, values from an arbitrary external source. Um, I'd be more than happy to sit down with you and go over in a little more. Actually, where's Joseph? Is Joseph Hall in here? Oh, good. He's working. The <laughs> Joseph Hall is the expert on SDB. So if you have any questions about that, he can probably answer them in a little more depth. All right. Any other uh, questions? Wow, did I do that bad? All right. Um, if there, yes. Thorium is open. And it's, uh, Sorry, and it's what? Master and it is master side. So um, when when we look at the entire reactor array, so to speak, we have the single event reactor, which people are most familiar with, and then there's Thorium. Both of these are in the open and run on a salt master. 
we're, we're working on a reactor that lives up in our enterprise software that will allow us to aggregate events and, re and create reactions across multiple masters. Um, and one of the other limitations of Thorium is that it is, it is memory bound. So um, there, are, there are some limitations as to just how ridiculously far you can take it. Although it, it can be quite powerful. Okay. All right, any other questions? Yes. Uh -huh. I was expecting that uh, we would have a more rich language to describe trigger conditions and something like if this event doesn't, uh, if I don't listen before this event, event in the past five seconds, I don't know yeah. But it looks like I can only do that in Python. That, okay, so, uh, so the question was, I expected Thorium to suck less uh, and not be all like Python bound. What's up with that? Yo. <laughs> so I had to translate. Uh, uh, are you from Germany? No, Portugal. Portugal. <laughs> I'm just guessing because it's a Sousa shirt. My, my ability to ascertain uh, accents is clearly quite bad. Um, what I was showing you for Thorium is defining Thorium states. The actual definition of what to look for in those events and what registers to put that information in um, is expressed in YAML. Yeah, but that's a whole nother class. Um, all right. I think that we are out of time. So I'm going to bid you adieu until you have to listen to me give a terrible keynote in the morning. Thank you all for coming to SOLCOMF.